So I'm excited to be here this morning standing with you on Martin Luther King Jr.'s holiday. We are rallying for the right of our children to get what they are due by law, a quality education. It's a civil right, it's fair, it's justice, and it's why we can't wait. Queremos un plan de acción. Queremos que nuestros hijos tengan una oportunidad. Yes. Ellos nos tienen que responder por mi hijo y por los demás niños. Queremos justicia educativa. Current arguments about how to improve public education through charter schools or more rigorous teacher evaluation treat parents as individual consumers of their children's schooling and rarely consider what organized groups of parents can contribute to school reform. This film examines how New York City parents initiated neighborhood campaigns, formed district-wide coalitions, and built a citywide organization to raise student achievement and expand educational justice across the city's struggling schools. The South Bronx burned throughout the 1970s. Much of its affordable housing was destroyed. This is the Mount Eden section of the South Bronx, one of the nation's poorest neighborhoods and one of the centers of the borough's devastation. In the 1980s, community organizations rebuilt the South Bronx. The new settlement apartments restored 15 multifamily buildings and provided a thousand renovated apartments to families with limited means. Housing is more than just bricks and mortar. Decent, safe, affordable, clean housing is key. But that beyond that, especially in a neighborhood that was so devastated, there was a lot of work needed to help reweave the social fabric of the neighborhood. One of our oldest after-school programs that's based at New Settlement, part of the tradition was to offer each year to parents whose children participate in that after-school program to participate in workshops, to learn about the schools which their children attended. They had so many parents' children that wasn't reading their grade level. It didn't make sense to me. I figured we could figure out a way to address it at least as a group. Like that. So that's basically what got me involved. They knew best. They were their children. Many of them themselves had gone to public school and they realized that the education their children were getting was not the education that they even had gotten. Others had come from other countries and came with the expectation that if they did their job and sent their children to school that the children would learn. But they realized that wasn't happening. That was some of the beginnings of what came to be known as the New Settlement Parent Action Committee. I met an organizer from the New Settlement Department Parent Action Committee who I called, she just had pit bull persistent. She would not go away. You need to come to this meeting. We need your input. This affects you. So finally I went and um, the rest has been history. After doing a lot of research, we realized that 17% of our children were reading at grade level. So out of every 100, you only had 17 reading at grade level. When the PAC discovered that most PS64 students could not read adequately, parents concluded that school failure, rather than individual children's limitations, was the core problem. So the PAC met with PS64's principal and the superintendent of the local school district about how to improve the school. They really just seemed to not hear or want to see what was wrong and really make it like it's not as bad as it seems. You know, we are troublemakers. Public school officials took over our meeting. And when they took over our meeting, it no longer became our meeting. Right. It became their meeting. They made us out to be bad parents. And I think that was a turning point for me because after that, I vowed that I'm going to learn as much as I can. What the PAC learned was that schools like PS64 could be improved. We knew what a bad school looked like. We didn't know what a good school looked like. We had a uh, school 165 that was pretty much the same size as CS64, the same demographics in terms of people or population, and how come it had been doing bad and the principal had turned it around, I think in about two years. The parents realized that the principal who was there at the time was a real impediment to any kind of progress. What's going on in this school is persistent educational failure. 
That means that this school is not doing good, this principal is not making it work. The PAC then discovered that principals could be removed by the chancellor, the head of the New York City school system, for their school's persistent educational failure. Because over a period of three years, he had not shown any improvement in reading and or math, and that was our big campaign to remove him based on those grounds. We are calling for the immediate removal of Principal Feliciano. We want your support. They launched a petition campaign and gathered many, many signatures. Again, not only of parents of children in the school, but of other community residents. And then I guess in an effort to help us out, the principal uh, got in a fight one day with one of his staff. They wound up wrestling on the floor, tumbling down the stairs in the presence of you know students. That, along with the work that the Parent Action Committee had done, led to the principal um, stepping down and leaving. Because an ineffective principal had rarely been removed through the actions of a community group, the PAC celebrated its victory and pledged to help the new principal improve the school. But when student outcomes did not improve, the PAC expanded its organizing to all of District 9 schools and asked newly appointed Chancellor Levy for help. A group of parents from District 9 in the Bronx came to send a message to Chancellor Levy that more than 73% of the students in their district are unable to read at grade level. They really thought we was bringing them a gift, and our whole idea of that was 72 out of every 100 children could not read at grade level. And you have to honestly ask yourself, which one of those kids are yours? The parents eventually succeeded in having a meeting with Chancellor Levy, and the parents were very well prepared, and they made a very, very compelling presentation. As the meeting began to approach its end, he, he basically said, that he wasn't going to accept, embrace, or support any of the recommendations. After a year of trying to convince District 9 officials and Chancellor Levy to support their reforms, the PAC demonstrated outside the Chancellor's National School Improvement Conference. Parents and students from Bronx School District 9 say Chancellor Levy isn't paying attention to the problems in their district. And of the 36 schools, 25 have not met the reading standards in the last two years. 77% of all of our children cannot read a level. At that point, I think parents were very discouraged. It was realized that in order to make the change that we expect to happen, not only in PS64 but throughout District 9, that we needed more power, and more power meant a broader base, more support, and so that was really the beginning of what became to be known as the Community Collaborative to Improve District 9 Schools. The Community Collaborative to Improve District 9 Schools, or CC9, brought together six community groups with long histories of neighborhood service. The groups were taking on a challenging task. District 9, with almost 30,000 students in 36 schools, was among the lowest performing, in terms of students reading at grade level, of all the school system's districts. The organizations each brought to CC9 roots in the community, resources, be they financial resources, staff resources, physical space for meetings, and relationships, relationships with people, whether they were neighborhood residents, representatives who were in elected office. Each of the organizations began to identify leaders and members and build a base. The CC9 groups shaped the coalition's structure to maximize parent decision making and to balance collaborative and confrontational strategies. The coalition hoped to work effectively with the school system, which had recently been brought under mayoral control and was led by a powerful chancellor, Joel Klein. CC9 also wanted to work with the United Federation of Teachers, the city's powerful teachers union. In New York City, there is a history of distrust and separation between parents and teachers. We had to figure out a way to, to try to soften the relationship between parents and teachers, and, but also not giving up our power, parents' power. The one that I really remember is a meeting at New Settlement in their community room there, <clears throat> where there must have been arguably 40 people, if not more. And that's where I really got to know or meet the people who were involved in CC9. One person turned to me, and she says, I don't trust you or your union. And I said, yeah, but you're here. 
She says, yeah, I'm here. I said, so, we'll see. Working with the teachers union was sometimes complicated. When CC9 parents raised the need to visit their children's classrooms, the union worried about the repercussions. There is nothing that should stop a parent from coming into a classroom. The issue was what would happen if parents in mass walked into a school and walked into 15 or 20 classrooms. Ongoing discussions between parents and teachers built the trust that produced an acceptable solution. Parents would make appointments to visit teachers' classrooms or to see teachers during their prep periods or at other available times. After this agreement, CC9 organized a large public rally to approve and to celebrate the CC9 platform. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to a celebration of hope and commitment to improving the quality of education for our children. My name is Anastasia García. Soy una madre de cuatro niños del distrito 9. Y una de las eh, cosas que me involucró a yo integrarme en este grupo es que yo quería una mejor educación para mis hijos y para los niños del sur del Bronx. And the United Federation of Teachers will not be the ones to break this commitment. We will support it, we will back it, we will work with parents and CBO groups to make our work. I am so happy to be named Regional Superintendent of this region, especially because of the tremendous support that I see here and the commitment that I've seen from CC9. This was one of the first times when a group was actually coming together and saying, we need to really uh, look at our schools. And they felt that the quality of teaching needed to really improve. And by looking at teachers who, were, who could be leaders and could really help and support other teachers, that that was the way to go. In our communities, teachers would have maybe one or two years experience or less, so they would come in and leave. So it was a high teacher turnover rate. And talking, I know, to my own children, it would be like, so how is Miss, oh no, she's gone. We have Mr. So-and-so. A few weeks later, how's Mr. So-and-so? He couldn't take it. He left. <laughs> Someone, so it was a revolving door. The lead teacher program focused on highly qualified teachers who had three to five years experience in the classroom and a proven record of student achievement. And what these teachers would do would mentor younger teachers, two teachers, two highly qualified teachers in a classroom. One teacher would spend the morning or the afternoon in the class while one teacher went and did the mentoring. As you work with your colleagues, you know, one-to-one, -one, they come to understand that we have a classroom, we have students that we have to work with just like they do. It's just that I have the time to support them during the day when normally I wouldn't be able to do it until probably after school. The lead teacher program seemed to me tailored to thinking about teaching as a career as well as thinking about how you actually prepare new teachers who may not otherwise get the mentoring and the proper induction that they need. We opted to ask representatives from CC9 to sit with the UFT at the bargaining table. Nothing like this had ever occurred before and nothing like this had ever occurred since. After a year of intensive CC9 organizing, the LEAD teacher program was approved as a pilot in 10 District 9 schools. At the Victory Rally, CC9 members, teacher union leaders, elected officials, celebrities, and local and citywide education leaders celebrated CC9's achievement and quickly began to plan the program's implementation. Starting first with the interview process. We sat down and formulated how that should look. So there was the initial screening that went out to applicants, CC parents right there along with everyone else. The questions were, were such such interesting and knowledgeable questions, you know, and, and, and to see parents actually sit at the table 
and, and have a voice. And devising the questions and how the panel would be set up and structured. Then we discussed a rating system and what we were looking for. To really stand up in front of the classroom and, and teach and have this teacher, you know, that's new and looking for ways to better her teaching to look at me and, and say, gee, I could do that. In the third grade, where most of the lead teachers were concentrated, um, that the students' uh, test scores uh, in uh, English language arts and, and math were actually, uh, their gains were larger than the city as a whole, than District 9 as a whole, um, and then the schools that they were compared to. When the lead teacher program that began as a pilot in 10 schools uh, was being expanded by the Department of Education, parents were on the one hand pleased, but on the other hand very disheartened. They helped shape the program. They sat at the table side by side with representatives of the United Federation of Teachers, representatives of the Department of Education, and they felt it was a true partnership. And when the Department of Education decided to take this model and replicate it on a much larger scale, that whole aspect of the lead teacher program was dismissed. They took the whole community involvement piece out of the expansion of the lead teacher program, which the um, evaluators felt was a huge part of why it was successful. It was us who brought all of them to the table you know, to help develop the program. The program was a success. Why in the world would the Department of Education and the mayor's office expand the program without including our input? It was a lesson learned. A bunch of parents limited to one school district was not enough. That if we were going to truly have a lasting impact on reforming and transforming public education in the city of New York, we were going to have to get more like-minded people on board with us. The Brooklyn Education Collaborative consisted of the UFT Parent Outreach, 1199 Child Care Fund, ACORN, CHAFE, Cypress Hills Advocates for Education. We started off with science equipment, um, realizing that in many of these schools, which are really high poverty neighborhoods of color, um, where school, many of the schools have been failing for many years, um, that they didn't even have science equipment in there. And so we fought for that and were very um, productive. And then we moved on to the big picture, which was science labs. And we realized that even those students in eighth grade had an eighth grade um, lab component on their regents exam. Many of the schools didn't have labs and so we really fought for science labs. We were thinking about building power across the city and had already established two other collaboratives. There was the Brooklyn Education Collaborative and there was the um, Brooklyn Queens for Education Collaborative. In order to have the impact that we needed to have that they need to be still more power and that it was a citywide Department of Education. Perhaps they need to be a citywide organization that helped move forward the agenda of educational justice. The three collaboratives came together to form that new citywide organization. The New York City Coalition for Educational Justice, or CEJ, whose mission was to end the inequities of resources and outcomes across the city schools. These goals were ambitious but necessary. The school system, with a million students in 1,400 schools, was failing far too many of them. And parent and community participation in educational decision-making had been eliminated by the new mayoral control legislation. The organizations that came together to create CEJ had real alignment in terms of who should be the drivers of change in communities. Ordinary people that know the real problems and ordinary people that actually have um, ideas about what the solutions should look like. When we came together to create CEJ, one of the first things that took place was actually a retreat that brought together leaders from each organization to meet each other and to actually explore what are the issues that bring us together. In that initial retreat, the need to dramatically improve the city's middle schools as the critical platform for high school and college success emerged as the focus of CEJ's first campaign. Children did really well in third grade, less well in fourth, and by the time they got to eighth grade or the middle grades, it was a mudslide and that the average child, no matter how smart he or she was, entered high school 
one or more grades behind. When we looked at the statistic, only one out of three kids was reading at grade level. Seeing those numbers and understanding those statistics was a real wake-up moment. The speaker, Christine Quinn, speaker of the city council. We were able successfully in setting up a meeting with her. She said, middle school is my baby, and I, you know, I've been trying to figure out a way to make it work. Once you meet with the CEJ leadership, it's very clear that they are parents, but they're also backed up by research. So it's kind of a great amalgam of the different pieces of what you need to get things done. She stood with us at a press conference, another cold went today, and said, we need to do something about middle school. At the rally, CEJ issued a report demonstrating the systemic failure of middle school education, particularly for African-American and Latino students, and recommended comprehensive changes. The rally also announced the formation of the City Council's Middle School Task Force, with two CEJ leaders, Carol Boyd and Zakia Ansari, among its members. CEJ really was kind of the uh, real-life compass of the task force, if you will, because they could tell us whether the solutions we talked about were going to work in their neighborhoods, in their children's school. We never lost sight of who we were, why we were there, and what was in our initial platform. Because of how we operate at CEJ, there was constant reporting back to the body and law saying, this is where we are, where do we go now? At the press conference after the middle school task force released its report, the mayor, the city council speaker, and the chancellor announced their response. A middle grades initiative that allocated $5 million to implement the task force recommendations in 51 poorly performing middle schools. CEJ pushed hard to make the middle grades initiative work, but the initiative seemed too limited in scope and too slow to take hold in the target middle schools. So CEJ intensified its campaign by organizing a major rally at St. Paul's Church in Lower Manhattan. So I'm excited to be here this morning standing with you on Martin Luther King Jr.'s holiday. We are rallying for the right of our children to get what they are due by law, a quality education. We may all be immigrants. However, we all have a common dream the best life for our children, including the best education. Unfortunately for many of us, the middle grade schools our children are attending are failing them. Porque las escuelas intermedias están fallando a nuestros hijos. Por eso sí, yo trabajo fuertemente para mejorar las escuelas intermedias. Para mí es un, un trabajo extraordinario que estamos haciendo todos. Porque padres como yo en, en otras partes de la ciudad, es que este, hablamos diferente idioma, diferente cultura, pero queremos lo mismo. ¿sí? Educación para nuestros hijos. Tenemos hoy aquí las caras de las personas que son afectadas. Los afroamericanos y los latinos son las escuelas donde tenemos más problemas, donde tenemos más dificultades, donde tenemos más disparidad. At the rally. CEJ released a report analyzing the city's failure to reduce the achievement gap in the middle grades. The report recommended extending learning time, implementing strategies to improve teacher and principal effectiveness, and providing the academic, social, and emotional supports necessary for student success. The report was produced for CEJ by the Annenberg Institute for School Reform. The staff at Annenberg really understood their role as being primarily oriented to support the leadership of the parents that were coming together. And it did that by providing really good research. Every member of CEJ that I have met is extremely knowledgeable about middle school reform, about New York City data. So I would imagine a lot of the work behind the scenes is educational. For example, if we want a study un estudio de, de cuáles son los exámenes que están pasando. Sí, hay una persona eh, específica que se dedica a, a buscar esos estudios donde nos dan un informe ¿sí? para, para, para cuando tenemos la campaña de mandar al Departamento de Educación, tú estás diciendo esto, pero lo, eso está pasando. Annenberg's staff not only generate the data that support CEJ's campaigns, the staff also provide data to the local campaigns of CEJ member groups. These teachers in Highbridge, a South Bronx community, 
are taking a walking tour organized by the Highbridge Community Life Center, a CEJ member group, and its parent organizing arm, the United Parents of Highbridge. The teachers are familiarizing themselves with the Highbridge neighborhood and its history. There was a time in the early 70s where we had a strong neighborhood movement, strong parents and neighborhood movement, and we demanded Mayor Lindsay that he build us a new school. In surprise to us, they decided to build PS 126. It was a great victory of parent and community organizing. And that's why we think we can get that movement going again and get our middle school. I have raised seven children in Highbridge. All seven had to be put on city buses to go to middle school. Ridiculous. It is time for a middle school in Highbridge. As CEJ developed its citywide middle school campaign, the United Parents of Highbridge launched a local campaign for a new middle school in the neighborhood. Annenberg staff produced the research showing the need for a new middle school. You're not gonna get what you want unless you fight for it. You're not gonna get it because you need it. You're gonna get that middle school the day that we come together and we stay together and we keep the pressure on. For three long years, the United Parents of Highbridge kept the pressure on through local demonstrations, candlelight rallies, building support from elected leaders, and organizing community-wide events. We want a middle school! Now! We want a middle school! Let us envision a school that works with the community, that is part of the community. Plan for us, build for us what we need for our kids in this community. It is irrational to think that our students can trek all the way to other parts of the Bronx when it is so difficult to get out of the neighborhood of Highbridge or into the neighborhood of Highbridge. We're here uh, with my friends Alicia, Alan, Jose, and Jocelyn. And they're here to say, through their artwork, which speaks louder than whatever words any adult can say here today, as to what type of school we want. The art show displayed neighborhood students' drawings of their ideal middle schools. At the show, the United Parents of Highbridge announced the city's approval of the new middle school. And parents decided to push for an environmental curriculum and an ecologically friendly building. After the city approved the site for the school and shared the architect's plans, the United Parents of Highbridge celebrated their victory. A new middle school focused on environmental sciences and sustainable energy. So the group began to make the new middle school an effective platform for high school and college success, the core of CEJ's ongoing campaign. CEJ's ongoing organizing had persuaded the city to expand its middle school initiative by increasing the amount of grant awards to struggling middle schools and by doubling the number of those schools receiving grants. So CEJ members began to develop a kindergarten to 12 reform platform that would prepare all the city students to graduate high school and succeed in college and careers. The thing that was different about CEJ is that because there was so much effort put into making sure that people had time to learn about each other and about the issues that we were working on, there was just a huge amount of, kind of human capital that we didn't have before. There are these amazing meetings that happen once a month on Saturdays where parents do a lot of preparation work. Those meetings have been kind of the, the core of the culture of CEJ. The culture of CEJ features simultaneous translation at all steering committee meetings. That's why these CEJ leaders are wearing headphones. There's no way you can come into somebody's community and not offer translation if you really want those parents engaged in what you're talking about. It's about respecting the cultures and the neighborhoods that we're targeting. The neighborhoods where our children are really failing are black and Latino areas. CEJ members were distressed because the new region's statewide graduation standards threatened to deny diplomas to almost 60% of the city's high school students, 
most of them African-American and Latino. So CEJ issued a report demonstrating the stark threat the new standards posed and pushed for rigorous reform of the high school curriculum, extended learning time, and comprehensive instructional supports. We cannot have 70% of the children graduating our high schools needing remediation right, when they right. enter college. No. Right. This is a sign that we need real curriculum and not test prep anymore. We need to stop teaching to the test and have a more well-rounded education and curriculum. Yes. Yes. We need to provide sports and arts and culture, which, is ha which has been removed from the curriculum. Well, let me just say that you are the grassroots leaders of our great city. Yeah. And in fact, you push the system in the right direction. Yeah. I'm pleased to welcome you to the Abyssinian Baptist Church. I'm pleased that we are able to host this gathering led by the Coalition for Educational Justice. And it is the responsibility not only of us, but the responsibility of the city of New York to make sure that every child, every child in this city has the privilege and the right to education. The school system as it stands was designed over 100 years ago at a time when we as a people of color were not expected to get any type of education. Equal opportunity to succeed in college and career is the racial and economic issue of today. And we are here today because only one out of three African American and Latino students and only one out of 10 immigrant students graduate with a Regents Diploma. Can we change that? So I want to say on behalf of the Coalition for Educational Justice, on behalf of all of their partners, that this has been a great rally and that we stand firmly with you in your fight for educational justice. So thank you very much for your attendance today. And remember that a people united will never be defeated. A people united will never be defeated. A people united will never be defeated. Give a big round of applause to the Coalition for Educational Justice. Good afternoon, and God bless you all. These outcomes suggest what education organizing that builds parent power can achieve. Similar organizing is going on in school districts across the country. Hopefully, school system leaders will increasingly realize that collaboration between schools and their organized parent and community constituencies can improve the futures of all our children. CJ is a real model in that way for, for our city and also for, for other cities of how to do um, very good grassroots-led community organizing work to improve education. Tener una, una educación de, de, de excelencia, que, que el pastel no solamente sea para unos cuantos, que la educación buena no solamente sea para unos cuantos niños, Que la educación sea buena para todos. And look, these are our kids. You can't, you can't keep telling us you can't do things. We're not going to take it anymore. We know that can be done. We know it's done in other schools. Why isn't it done in our communities? And to use a quote that I, I saw one of my children use within just yesterday. It came from Malcolm X. It was something to the effect of, "When I think of things around me, it makes me sad and I want to cry." But then I stop and it gets me angry and that's what brings about the change.